July 14, 1999, Milwaukee bet everything on a single machine. The colossal big blue crane hired to lift a stadium roof that would define a city. Yet in minutes, triumph turned to disaster when 1,500 tons of steel and power collapsed, taking three lives and exposing a chain of ignored warnings, flawed calculations, and deadly gusts that defied engineering limits. Official reports blame the wind, but the real causes run deeper, a forensic puzzle of human error and hidden vulnerabilities. What happened inside those critical moments, and how did one of construction's mightiest giants become the centerpiece of Milwaukee's greatest tragedy? The answers might change how you look at engineering risk forever. In the late 1980s, Milwaukee's leaders faced a crossroads. The city's aging county stadium was falling behind modern ballparks, threatening the Brewers' future and the local economy tied to every game. Civic boosters, business owners, and baseball fans all wanted something bigger, an arena that could guarantee opening day, rain or shine, and put Milwaukee back on the map. The answer was bold. A new stadium with a fully retractable roof, one of the first of its kind in North America. Architects from HKS and NBBJ, working alongside engineers from Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, began sketching out a vision that was as ambitious as it was unprecedented. The design called for a sweeping, fan-shaped roof made up of 30 massive panels, each one engineered to slide and rotate on command. When closed, the panels would shield the field from Wisconsin's unpredictable weather. When open, they'd reveal the sky and let in summer breezes. The mechanics behind this vision required not just architectural flair, but brute strength. Every single panel weighed hundreds of tons, and the largest stretched nearly 400 feet across. Construction broke ground in 1996, launching a project that would dominate the city's skyline for years. The stadium's footprint sprawled across the Menominee River Valley, with steelwork towering above the old ballpark. As each month passed, anticipation grew. Local newspapers tracked every milestone, from the first concrete pour to the arrival of specialty steel. But as the roof's unique geometry took shape, it became clear that ordinary cranes couldn't handle the job. The heaviest panels demanded a lifting solution on a scale rarely seen outside of the world's largest infrastructure projects. That need set the stage for Big Blue, a machine designed to move mountains. The stadium's promise of all-weather baseball, civic pride, and economic revival now rested on a single colossal crane and the team that would operate it. Big Blue was never just another crane. At full extension, its boom reached 567 feet, taller than the tallest building in Milwaukee. The main body rode on twin crawler tracks, each weighing more than a diesel locomotive. Counterweights stacked up to 2.4 million pounds, anchoring the machine against the pull of gravity and the force of every lift. When fully rigged, Big Blue could hoist 1,500 tons in a single move, enough to lift a fully loaded Boeing 747 straight off the runway. To bring this mechanical giant to Milwaukee, the project team signed a lease valued between 10 and $15 million. That price tag covered not just the crane, but the global expertise behind its assembly, transport, and operation. Big Blue's arrival was a spectacle, Dozens of flatbeds, weeks of assembly, and a crew of specialists from Lampson International working around the clock. The stadium's fate, and the city's hopes for a new era of baseball, rested on this one machine doing what no other could. Every component was engineered for extremes. The boom, built from high-strength steel lattice, stretched nearly two football fields in length. The turntable and kingpin, forged from heavy alloy, formed the heart of the slewing mechanism, allowing Big Blue to rotate its massive load with inch-level precision. Even the hydraulic systems were oversized, designed to move hundreds of tons with smooth, controlled power. 
The scale was almost abstract, each pin, each bolt, each cable measured in feet and tons, not inches and pounds. But for all its might, Big Blue was still a single point system. Everything, roof, schedule, city pride, depended on one set of gears, one kingpin, one crew. The stadium's vision of all-weather baseball and architectural glory now balanced on the limits of steel and calculation. In the world of heavy lifts, even a giant can be undone by forces you can't see. Soil at the Miller Park site was never truly solid. Geotechnical surveys logged pockets of loose fill and clay beneath the crane's path, but the real threat came from a broken water main buried just 20 feet away. Days before the lift, water seeped through the subgrade, softening ground that was supposed to anchor millions of pounds. By July, engineers and foremen walked the site, noting that the crane's tracks had settled unevenly. Measurements after the collapse would show nearly a foot, about 12 inches of subsidence under one crawler, enough to tilt the machine's entire base and shift weight onto the kingpin. Above ground, the threat was invisible, but just as real. Weather reports from July 14th show steady winds at 22 to 24 miles per hour, with sudden gusts topping 35. At ground level, anemometers read within the crane's supposed limit, but wind climbs with height. At the tip of Big Blue's boom, over 300 feet in the air, the panel being lifted acted like a sail catching every burst. The panel itself measured nearly 200 feet across, weighing over 450 tons. Even a modest gust could push hundreds of pounds sideways, turning a vertical lift into a battle against unpredictable forces. Crane-mounted wind meters were designed to sound alarms if conditions got dangerous, but after the collapse, investigators found dead batteries in two critical monitors. Whatever warnings the those devices might have given went unheard. The only record left comes from local weather stations and the testimony of workers who felt the wind buffet their equipment and refused to climb higher. No one had recalibrated the crane's load charts for side loading or drag. The charts on hand accounted for vertical weight, not the lateral pull of wind on a giant steel truss. As the soil softened and the wind picked up, the safety margins shrank. The ground shifted beneath Big Blue and the air above battered its boom. Together, these forces pushed the crane beyond its engineered limits, setting the stage for what would follow. Warnings traveled up and down the job site that morning. Iron workers on the roof, veterans who had spent decades in the trade, watched flags snap in the wind and felt the steel sway under their boots. Some refused to climb any higher, packing up their gear and heading for ground level. Others radioed supervisors, voicing concern that the wind was too strong for a lift of this size. The message was clear. Conditions were changing and not for the better. But the project's momentum was hard to stop. Schedules were tight, with every delay threatening cost overruns and public embarrassment. Multiple contractors, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, Lampson International, and Danny's Construction shared responsibility, but no single authority held the power to call off the lift. Foremen debated on radios and in huddles near the crane's base. Some wanted to wait out the wind. Others insisted the window was closing and the job had to get done. Load charts sat in binders, their numbers printed in black and white. Yet those charts assumed calm air not the crosswinds sweeping through the valley. The calculations on hand showed Big Blue could handle the weight, 450 tons of steel truss, but they didn't account for the sideways drag of wind on a roof panel nearly 200 feet across. No adjustment was made for the sail effect at elevation, even as gusts rattled the rigging and bent the panel like a giant wing. Iron workers who voiced their doubts found little recourse. The site's safety protocols lacked a clear stop work authority. If a worker refused to go up, another might be asked to take his place. Radio traffic from that afternoon, summarized in later investigations, shows repeated calls for caution, but no formal order to halt the operation. 
The culture on site rewarded moving forward, not standing down. In the hours before collapse, two wind alarms on the crane sat silent, their batteries dead. No one on the ground could hear what the iron workers felt in their bones. A job site on the edge. The decision to proceed wasn't made by a single voice, but by a hundred small omissions. Warnings unheeded, charts uncorrected, authority left undefined. As Big Blue rolled into position for the final lift, the gap between procedure and reality widened, leaving the crew exposed to forces no one had fully calculated. At 4.45 p.m., the final lift begins. Big Blue's operator, known as Jack to the crew, sits behind the controls, his eyes on analog dials and the shifting shadows of the steel truss overhead. The roof panel, a 450-ton giant, nearly 200 feet across, hangs from the boom, swaying as the wind gusts climb. On the ground, the official wind meter reads just under 20 miles per hour, but at the boom tip, over 300 feet in the air, the true force is stronger. Anemometer readings from nearby stations show gusts reaching 27, even 35 miles per hour. The panel itself acts like a sail, catching every burst. Radio chatter crackles between the operator and foreman. Some workers urge caution, but the decision holds. Proceed. The load rises off its cribbing, steel cables biting into their anchor points. At 5.04, the panel clears the ground. Jack inches the controls, rotating the boom toward its final position. The crane's massive kingpin, a 12-inch steel shaft, 11 feet long, bears the entire turning force, its heart hidden deep inside the machine. Unknown to those on site, a half-inch bronze spacer, not part of the original design, sits between mating surfaces. This small change shifts the kingpin's margin, concentrating stress at its weakest point. Wind surges again, the panel swings, pulling sideways. The kingpin flexes, forced to handle a load its charts never predicted. On the ground, two safety alarms, meant to warn of excessive wind and tilt, stay silent. Later, investigators will find their batteries dead. At 5.10, the panel is nearly in place. The crane lists, its base settling into soil softened by a broken water main. The kingpin, already stretched to its limit, faces a final twisting shock. At 5.12, a sharp crack splits the air. The kingpin shears, the boom buckles, and in seconds, Big Blue's upper works collapse. The panel crashes down, striking a man basket suspended nearby. Three iron workers, Jeffrey Wisher, William DeGrave, and Jerome Starr, lose their lives in an instant. The collapse is captured on a safety inspector's camera, freezing the moment when steel, wind, and human error converge. Steel and dust hang in the air. The ground shakes, and within seconds, the silence is replaced by shouts, alarms, and the roar of engines. Workers scramble away from the twisted wreckage, some ducking behind equipment, others frozen by the scale of what's just happened. The boom of Big Blue lies scattered across the site, its counterweights sunk deep into the soft earth. The roof panel, now a mangled mass of steel, blocks the main access path. Emergency crews rush in, weaving between debris and fallen cables. The first priority is the men in the man basket, iron workers Jeffrey Wisher, William DeGrave, and uh, Jerome Starr. Their colleagues and paramedics reach them quickly, but the outcome is clear. Five more workers are pulled from the edge of the collapse, some with broken bones, others dazed and bloodied. The site, once alive with the rhythm of construction, is now a field of loss and confusion. Engines on the crippled crane keep running, their diesel tanks ruptured in the fall. Fumes drift across the scene, raising the risk of fire. Responders scan for sparks, knowing that a single ignition could turn disaster into inferno. In the chaos, a front-end loader is pressed into service, scooping dirt to build a makeshift berm. The goal is simple, stop the fuel from spreading. Buy time for rescue crews to work. There's no manual for what comes next, just instinct and urgency. An OSHA inspector, still holding the camera that captured the collapse, stands at the edge of the debris. 
His hands shake as he surveys the damage. Later, he'll describe the scene in industry safety classes, his voice catching on the details he can't forget. For many on site, the images from that day will replay for years, twisted steel, the smell of diesel, the sound of radios calling for help. The shock lingers, a reminder that even giants can fall in an instant, and that every decision on a job site carries a weight beyond calculation. OSHA investigators arrived with a mandate, assign blame and levy consequences. The agency cited Mitsubishi, Heavy Industries, Lampson International, and Danny's construction for willful safety violations, issuing fines that totaled $540,000. But regulatory penalties were only the beginning. Families of the three iron workers, Jeffrey Wisher, William DeGrave, and Jerome Starr, filed civil suits that exposed internal emails, site logs, and a pattern of dismissed warnings. In court, juries heard how deadlines were prioritized over safety and how supervisors overlooked mounting risks. The legal battle stretched for years, ending with settlements that reached $99 million. Jury awards included $94 million in punitive damages, though much of that sum was later negotiated down. For the companies involved, the collapse was not just a tragedy, but a financial reckoning. A reminder that ignoring red flags can cost far more than a day's delay. Industry standards did not stand still after Milwaukee. OSHA issued new mandates. Every large crane now requires an anemometer at the boom tip with wind data logged in real time. Load charts must factor in not just vertical weight, but the force of wind pushing sideways on massive panels. Before any heavy lift, contractors are required to test soil stability, especially if water lines or weather have changed the ground. These rules are more than paperwork. Ironworker unions pushed for clear stop work authority, giving every crew member the power to halt a job if conditions feel unsafe. In the decade that followed, Crane-related fatalities in the United States dropped by 40%. Annual memorials at the stadium remind the community what's at stake. The legacy of Big Blue is written in safer job sites and a culture that puts caution before deadlines. On July 14, 1999, at 5.12 p.m., the collapse of Big Blue claimed three lives and changed construction safety forever. Federal records confirm wind gusts exceeded 27 miles per hour, well above the crane's operating limit. OSHA's investigation found a sheared kingpin, track subsidence from a broken water main, and missing load chart adjustments for side loads. Despite documented warnings from iron workers, no stop work order was issued. Some details, such as the exact sequence of mechanical failure and uh, original load chart data, remain undisclosed or lost. In the aftermath, OSHA levied $540,000 in fines and courts, awarded $99 million in settlements. Industry-wide, new standards like mandatory anemometers and stricter wind protocols have contributed to a 40% drop in crane-related deaths since 1999. The evidence is clear. Ignoring compounding risks can have irreversible consequences. Every lesson from Big Blue is written in official reports and memorials, not just as history, but as a reminder of the cost of complacency.